Hello. Hello. And Simon welcome. Here. Hi, Simon. I'm Lisa Francesca Nand, host of the Big Travel Podcast and also the WTM Insights Podcast. And welcome everyone to the WTM Global Hub and this webinar, webinar rather, which we're calling Travel Opinions with Simon Calder. As you can see, the lovely Simon is with me now. And uh, before we speak to you, Simon, I've just got to do a bit of housekeeping. Apparently, it's best to avoid the more button below the webinar description, as this will take you away from this. And we don't want to have to, you to log back in and that sort of things. Uh, and also, you'll be able to ask us some questions at the end and leave feedback during and after. Uh, and also interact with us by clicking the four grey buttons below your presentation screen. You might apparently need to take it out of full screen mode to do that. But do feel free to ask questions. We're going to have a little chat here and also uh, leave feedback feedback if you want and there will be a Q&A at the end as well so without further ado Simon hello again and welcome to the uh, to the webinar. Uh, great to see you Lisa and of course it's fantastic to be able to talk to people right across the UK and across the world at what is of course um, uh, the worst time that any of us has ever known for the travel industry which is causing so much stress anxiety grief um, among both the people who are working in the industry and, of course, their customers. Well, I'm, I've been desperate to talk to, I'm, uh, to you. I'm sort of Googling everything you're saying every day. You're like the, uh, you're like the oracle for us all right now. So I'm so glad to have you here. And uh, how's lockdown been treating you so far? You must feel like you've had your wings clipped a bit because I know. Uh, I certainly do. This, uh, I, I flew into Heathrow just before lockdown. This, as I'm afraid, not seen any action. Uh, I'm trying to write to the passport office and get um, a refund for, for lack of use. Uh, no, it's, it's just awful. I mean, I'm obviously uh, very, very keen to do what I can to help the industry, to help consumers um, at a time when kind of there aren't any very obvious right answers because we've never been in this position before. But it's just all the time just trying to talk to people, find out what their concerns are, what they are doing. And of course, try to make sense of this uh, situation, which is changing every moment. Um, I've just heard that uh, East Timor has closed everything to flights indefinitely. And it's, it's just stuff happening where if it, if it kind of happened in normal times, what happens in an hour at the moment in the coronavirus pandemic uh, would be a week or a fortnight's worth of news in the travel industry normally. It's just hard to keep up, isn't it? So, I mean, let's try and make sense of it here. We're going to try and make sense of it. What is the current situation in terms of the business of travel, the travel industry? Well, shall we start with one very big number? Um, this is the money that, and we're just talking here specifically about the UK. Obviously, I'm delighted to broaden it to uh, the rest of the world, and I look forward to reading questions from, from wherever you are on the planet. Um, but the... Uh, by the time by the time three o'clock rolls around, um, since you and I started talking, that will be I calculate seventy two million pounds that the industry has lost. Now, of course, that is um, if effectively going through a whole lot of figures relating to the UK industry, uh, domestic industry, to the outbound industry, to cruise, to airlines. Um, uh, but but that is it's, it's ridiculous. It's uh, an absurd amount of money. And of course, nobody knows how much of that is going ultimately to come back. But very sadly, as we've seen with um, previous shutdowns, whether they've been caused by uh, volcanoes or specific country related ones, actually, most of that money is never seen again. And most of the very good people working in travel will be harmed by that. It's just awful to think about, isn't it? I mean, you think about, you know, people moan about big airlines and big businesses asking for help, but it's not just about the big businesses. It's everyone, it's the tiny businesses they feed, you know, that trickle all the way down to the, the cleaners, the people that make the lunches, you know, from, from everywhere. The, the span is just ridiculous. The musicians, you know, the DJs, everyone that's been affected by this, uh, by this crisis. Um, it's quite difficult to quantify, but what do you think, uh, who's been the hardest hit at the moment? What sector? Uh, I, I must say cruise, I think um, that is, uh, well, I mean, we're talking about a relatively small section of the travel industry, obviously hugely important, um, very, very uh, financially worthwhile, right up until I would say 
probably late January was when I started getting calls because people were saying, hang on, my, my cruise to China is, uh, odd things are happening. Um, so, so you got about 30 million people cruising worldwide every year it was, of course, going to be the best ever year for the cruise industry. And now you have, what, 277, I think, ships just laid up. Some of them are in what's called a warm layup where they've got actually the full complement of crew. And so they could be back in service in a couple of weeks, probably. But others are in a cold layout. And that means that their crew are spread right across the world. So in order for a cruise to happen, you've got to line up so many different things. You've got to have the ship where it needs to be. You've got to have the passengers there. Um, you've got to bring in the crew. And the, one of the great things about cruising is so, so multinational, so diverse. Um, they've all got to come in. And then where are you going to go? Um, if you take just a standard Mediterranean itinerary, you are talking about seven or eight different jurisdictions and they are all going to have different policies about whether they want tourists in generals, general and cruise ships in particular. Um, so I think cruise in the short term is going to have a tough time. In the medium term, you know, selling out to the end of uh, 2021, that's going to be a really difficult ask, particularly since so many of the... Um, uh, target audience are uh, in uh, over over seventy. I'm not, I'm not for a moment saying that 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 you know they're the standard demographic, but clearly there is a lot of interesting cruises from um, uh, for, from over seventies. They're being warned: do not go on a cruise ship. Now that obviously would have to end, and there's so much which will need that will need to happen. And then longer term, the cruise industry has to have a think about well, what what do we do? Who are we catering for? It's a a really tough time. Um, so I'd say cruise is hurting the most. But then at the other extreme, yes, um, the, the, the one person tour operation who is just being overwhelmed by people demanding their money back within the uh, sh scheduled two two weeks at the same time as they're trying to get from the airlines, from from uh, bed banks or from whoever, uh, trying to get refunds. And it's simply not adding up. And you've got this industry, which has been brilliant at sending hundreds of millions of people off on great vacations and suddenly it's turned into an industry where they're trying to hand money back um uh, for, at a time when there's no cash coming in it's absolutely uh de desperate desperate you know as a, as a travel professional I, I don't want to take you know i've got flights booked the same as you simon we've all got flights and and holidays and things booked that we're either trying to get a refund for now or uh you know or taking a voucher and i know personally that it's better for me to to take the voucher and you know to keep the travel industry on its feet but however i'm thinking well actually i need the money as well and it's such a dilemma in terms of people you know what they should do now and you know if, if people in the industry are travelers as well you know we're all in the same position both professionally and and personally but we'll talk a little bit about the cruises again and airlines and hotels and specific areas of the industry but just in terms of the UK and I know we've got an, an international audience at the moment but in terms of the UK we've had a lot of talk about furloughing and small business loans and that sort of thing and I know for many people they haven't actually that hasn't actually come to fruition yet it's quite difficult to access but do you think these schemes anything like this is actually having a help but actually benefiting the industry as yet? Uh, yes, it certainly is. And actually, the, the best example of that is on a, a larger scale so that, for example, EasyJet, British Airways have um, uh, certainly in the case of British Airways, over 22,000 people. I'm not sure of the exact figure with um, with EasyJet, uh, many thousands um, of, of uh, typically cabin crew, uh, ground staff who are being kept going effectively until the end of June. Um, I think we will see with the job retention scheme run by the government, uh, July, we'll, you'll probably get July back as well, maybe into August. But um, uh, it's it's yeah, the, the country is obviously going into um, a very severe recession. And that's, of course, one of the many, many problems in this perfect storm. Uh, the fact that uh, tr the travel industry is trying to sort out the immediate crisis it has always, as it's always done, got to look to the future. Um, it's got to bring people together at a time we're told to keep apart. And it's got to do that while the, its traditional customers are saying, really, sorry, I'm on 80 percent of my income and uh, or, or my small business has had to fold. And therefore, uh, yeah, I can't go anywhere at the moment. And in fact, I'm, I'd like the money I paid you for next year back as well, please. So awful, awful times. I mean. It's the industry of human happiness. 
I want to stay optimistic. I'm sure that when we come back in five years' time, we'll look back and think, crikey, how did we ever get through that? But get through it, we will. It's just a question of how to limit the pain and the long-term damage. Uh, you, you mentioned the industry of human happiness, and I think that's a, a lovely way to look at it. And I always say this, is that travel is not just about going on your holiday and having a nice time, although that's really important. It's about people seeing the people they love, families, you know, the places they love. People, it really affects the emotions, not just to relax a relaxing couple of weeks in the sun, which really affects the emotions as well. It's an emotional industry, and that's what makes it so, you know, travel so beautiful for the rest of us. And, and travel, you know, not being able to travel is, is very, very hard. But we'll talk a little bit about the, the more sort of lovey-dovey side of it at the, at the end uh, just in the nitty-gritty stuff airlines we've seen fly b virgin australia south african airways either collapse entirely or many fall into administration virgin atlantic were refused their government loan and now richard branson has obviously as we know been very very vocal about issues and people have you know rightly or wrongly you know got a bit annoyed with him for that but oh, oh is there potentially is the potential for airlines big airlines like that to collapse Look, just again, looking at this from a, a UK perspective, and I will branch out and go global in just a moment. Um, one reason why the UK has absolutely the best travel industry in the world is because it's also got the most ferociously competitive and successful aviation industry in the world. So you've got EasyJet, of course, um, Europe's second biggest uh, budget airline uh, based in the UK, British Airways, very, very successful um, uh, legacy carrier. Um, Ryanair making the UK its main uh, base for operations. Um, Jet2, of course, doing great things, um, spreading south into Stansted, and who knows, maybe we'll talk about this in a little while, uh, into Gatwick. Um, and so you've got, uh, uh, as well as that, Virgin Atlantic, who in normal times are exactly what British Airways won't admit it, but exactly what British Airways needs, a kick in the pants, a really good challenger who is forcing British Airways to completely up its game as it has been doing for the last 36 years and long may it continue. I must say, I don't think that the uh, uh, Virgin travel operations have done themselves any favours um, in the way that they have played this crisis. Mm. And I don't know what will happen to Virgin Australia. I suspect that both Virgin Australia and Virgin Atlantic will uh, emerge from the other side of this, but in um, kind of uh, much reduced circumstances. You mentioned South African Airways. Well, um, look, never waste a good crisis is um, uh, what a lot of people say. Um, and one good thing which will come out of this is, I'm so, so sorry to say it because I they've got some fantastic professionals in South African Airways, but they need to start again. Um, this has been an absolute outrage the way that it has cost the South African uh, taxpayer so many billions of dollars over the years. Um, we'll see stuff happening in the Gulf. Uh, I don't think that Etihad and Emirates will be socially distant for very much longer. If you see what I mean, that would make uh, perfect sense, reduce the uh, competition. Um, the fact that the UAE shut its skies and thereby uh, caused immense amounts of, um, of grief for an awful lot of people who are depending on Emirates and to a lesser extent Etihad to get home is, is significant. Um, US carriers, let's just look at them. They're, they're, as usual, the federal government is just saying, how many how many billion dollars did you need? Um, and, and handing over the cash. Um, and and other, other countries, well, yeah, we saw Flybe collapse, of course, just, just as this was developing. Um, it would obviously last, not have lasted in the uh, new reality of uh, coronavirus. Um, great, great, sad, uh, uh, very, very sad event. And what's particularly sad is that the excellent people at Flybe were looking forward to, you know, there they are, collapse in February, at least you're going into the summer season. And so everybody could look forward to being re-employed by a different airline. I'm afraid that is not the case with British Airways saying we need to lose 29% of our staff, 12,000 people, uh, just, just dreadful. Um, however, we, we, but, but if I can try and be optimistic, um, <laughs> <laughs> Having just said 12,000 people we know are losing their jobs. Um, the, the outlook for aviation that accompanied that announcement 
suggests, and I've done the maths on this, that British Airways is going to reduce by 22%. That will have huge implications at Gatwick, by the way, which is why Jet 2 may well be thinking, hmm, well, we, we're you know, gradually expanding and uh, there'll be quite a lot of slots available there. Um, but a 22% fall in the scale of your operations is not as bad as many people thought. Our uh, best case remain largely flat in terms of fleet size and therefore in terms of operations. Uh, worst case, reduced by one sixth. Um, so that's, again, not too bad. What, of course, uh, we have no idea about is what's going to be required of the airlines and of the passengers in terms of um, social distancing, in terms of procedures at airports. And that uh, could actually really hamper things from a, from a business, from a financial, from a personal point of view. Do you think that um, the legacy airlines or the, the budget airlines, you know, what sort of type of carrier is, is better placed to sort of weather this storm? A well-run airline. Um, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to sound facetious, but that, no, that's no, what's going to make all the difference. So, uh, for example, tomorrow, Wizz Air is setting up operations from Gatwick, from, forgive me, from Luton uh, to 15 destinations, um, uh, places like Tenerife, Tel Aviv, um, eight airports I can pretty much guarantee of you've never heard of in Romania. Um, uh, but but it's not doing that to make huge amounts of money. It will probably lose, I'm um, guessing, you know, maybe 15,000 on a on a, a rotation to Tenerife, a um, bit less to Budapest. Um, it's doing it because it wants to keep going, because if you've got an, an airline that's alive, then you're really ready for when people come back. Um, and so, so yeah, they're a good, well-run airline with a lot of cash. Ditto Ryanair, ditto EasyJet, ditto British Airways. And so, you know, they, they will come back. They're having a horrible time right now. But um, uh, there's an awful lot of strength there. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm kind of – we're, we're going to have to get used to paying more, having fewer choices um, and fewer people flying. But it's not going to be the end of the world as we know it. Well, as a consumer, that's an interesting thing, because I've been wondering myself whether we will be paying more, because obviously there's going to be fewer people flying, there's possibly going to be a middle seat empty, that sort of thing. Or will we possibly be playing less because they want to get us on there? And what do you think? You're, you're going to veer to us uh, more, aren't you? I can see it. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Here we are. Here's my mug. And um, by the way, this is um, I'm <laughs> being sponsored by Ryanair. It's, it's a sad reflection of the fact that when you go to the Ryanair headquarters in Dublin, they have to have... You have to have reusable cups, which is great, but they make you pay it, pay for it. So, of course, uh, they do. Four euros or something for this one. Of course, mm. they do. They make you pay um, for everything. But, uh, but that's very, very salient. So, yeah, last time I was talking to Ryanair, they will have what they did after 9 11. Um, and older people in the travel industry will remember uh, that actually Ryanair, uh, not many people were particularly aware of until that terrible, terrible. Uh, catastrophe unfolded and until airlines effectively uh, once again kind of semi shut down. Um, Ryanair kind of just came out and, and said, right, anywhere you want to go, £10 um, just to get people travelling again. And they will be doing exactly the same thing. You can go back even further um, to long before your parents were born, Lisa, to um, 1991, first Gulf War. <laughs> British Airways came out with the world's greatest sale. Um, just astonishing bargains. And that was a really good way to kickstart things. Once life settles down, then, well, you've got a whole range of things. I mean, British Airways very much wants to become a more efficient uh, carrier. So uh, particularly if the if the price of oil starts, uh, keeps down to sort of, uh, two and sixpence a, a gallon, um, that's going to uh, help them out. Um, they're getting rid of all their kind of very thirsty, very old uh, high maintenance jets. Um, so in a sense, their costs aren't going to go up particularly. They could even come down. But that doesn't mean they're going to be saying, great, and our fares will fall in proportion. I think in exactly, exactly the opposite. They are losing at the moment, uh, well, in the case of EasyJet, because they told us £5 million a day, um, they're going to want to make that money up. And the best way to do that is keep a lid on capacity, hope that demand comes back strongly, and then just charge people a lot of money to be on those 
aircraft. So yeah, it's a tough uh, one, though, term, isn't it? Yeah, well, we will look back on 2019 as being absolutely peak mobility when you had the widest range, where you had the most competitive fares. Um, and we might be back in sort of five years' time, but it's not going to look quite the same. I'm trying to be positive. You are. I can feel it in you. You know, you're 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 giving us the doom and gloom, and you're trying to be positive as well. Uh, just before, uh, let's talk about hotels actually, because we've spoken about cruises quite heftily. But um, hotels. We've been hearing a lot of hotels with plans to reopen, with a lot of significant adjustments. Um, you know, uh, larger chains coming out of the, uh, the a larger chain is going to come out of this better. Are the smaller chains and individual people going to go? There's going to be no buffets there's going to be no communal areas at first you're going to be doing anything online but I mean who's well placed to, to weather this storm you know in, in the, the larger people or, or the smaller people yeah my 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 view is actually that the hotel sector is better placed than most other sectors of the industry and yeah it's just absolutely awful for the well across the UK alone hundreds of thousands of staff um, it's terrible for the um, proprietors who were expecting a great Easter, uh, fantastic start to uh, early summer and are simply not getting any business. But the hotel industry has always struck me as a sort of bit of an outlier in the travel industry because it's uh, kind of veering very much towards a property business. And it's you know, a hotel if you're in, well, it doesn't matter where you are, in, in central London, um, in uh, the, the coast of, of, uh, of some beautiful Mediterranean country um, or indeed a country house hotel somewhere. Um, it is a piece of property for which you would ideally like to earn a return but since you're in the property business you know that um, uh, prices can fluctuate and you know that um, the, the rates that you will be able to command are variable. So in a sense with aviation you've got very 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 high fixed costs and pretty low marginal costs. Um, discounting the costs of ownership of a hotel, which I know is a big ask. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, the, the um, uh, you, know, you, you, you can mothball a hotel relatively more easily than you can a, uh, a an airline. And furthermore, if you're a hotel and you're looking at 20% occupancy for the first week in July, that's still worth you getting out of bed for. If you're an, an airline, and you're looking at a 10, 20% load factor first week in July, you're going to stay on the ground. So, um, I, I, yeah, I, and I think the chains will stay the chains. Um, it's going to be interesting to manage these, the, the, the changes. But I think great small family run hotels will have a, a very good future, um, particularly if you kind of veer to, towards the view that our traveling habits are going to become kind of more modest uh we're not necessarily going to be looking for great luxury yet you know, we just want to have a travel experience and you're actually more more likely to find that in a relatively small hotel than you are in a, a fantastic um five star all inclusive but um other people who know the, the hotel market better than me may well wish to heckle you can do that of course <laughs> I'll, I, I tempted to heckle, but you know the, the the bigger hotels will get hit by the business travellers, won't they? And that's a whole other rabbit hole oh, to go right. down. The same as um, Airbnb and that sort of thing, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, can we can we talk very briefly? Do you mind, um, Lisa, just about? No, I, don't mind. I mean. Uh, yeah, I know that clearly um, WTM in November will attract an awful lot of people who are involved in the business sector, and by then we will know a great deal more about how traveller behaviour has changed change it will um the fact that we're conducting this um event uh using this technology you know, two months ago if you said oh Simon, why don't we do this on the 30th of uh, april uh you know two o'clock we, we can get together <laughs> I'd say, no, i'll come and see you and that'd be great or we can we can you know, uh, so, so we are using this technology there are people right across doing this nobody has had to get on a plane to go there you're going to have a couple of things. The big businesses that are bankrolling so much of the long haul aviation industry and of the four or five star hotels, they're going to be skint. They are going to say, so uh, let's just think, you know, we've got these um, lawyers or investment bankers. Normally we send them to New York. That's going to be uh, five and a bit grand on the airfares even with the deals we've got and then they're going to be staying in these fancy hotels so stick another couple of grand on top of that um and actually we'd rather you you um you, know, you demonstrated um from the comfort of your own pajamas that you were uh, perfectly happily able to use your expertise 
um, on on Zoom or on uh, Microsoft Teams or whatever. So um, let's carry on like that, at least for a while. So you'll either see that happens for a few weeks and everybody thinks, no, I'm going to go and see uh, Marty in, in New York. And um, uh, by the way, that also means I'll be able to go out and have some fantastic times in the bars and restaurants. Or it will be that going to see Marty in New York for uh, becomes a sort of once a year activity rather than once a month, once every uh, couple of weeks. In which case, if you are an airline with a big uh, business class uh, product, and of course most of the legacy carriers are, then you are going to have to do some reconfiguring pretty quick. And again, you and me, Lisa, in the back of the plane, who are you know off peak, I'm I'm very very happy to pay three hundred pounds, so four hundred dollars round trip to the US off season because the airline frankly doesn't care how much I pay because um they, they've got a full business class. If that business class isn't full, then um there are some uh, unfortunate implications for everyone. Oh, you know what? I'm desperate to go and visit Marty in New York. You know, whoever he is, I'm on the plane as soon as possible. Just before I get on to my burning question, and I think this is the, the one that I've been Googling every day and the one that so many of us want to know, uh, just quickly, tour operators and, and travel agents, what do you think the future is there? How are they holding up? What What's going to happen in the future? Well, of course, we lost Thomas Cook very sadly um, seven months ago now. Crikey, doesn't time, uh, yeah, it seems like a million years. Uh, and that left two very good, very well, very well placed players, um, Tui, of course, and uh, the uh, relentlessly expanding Jet 2, along with um, many much smaller um, and, and um, uh, very professional tour operators. Um, across the retail sector, well, Yes, it's you. You've got again the the whole industry has kind of um, become a bit more rarefied over the last uh, few years. If you just look at the number of high street uh, travel agent closures, you you will see that. And in a sense, while I, I regret anybody losing their job, that the, if you've got a smaller but more professional sector, then that's great. The trouble is, this has been uh, thrown at them at a time which is. Um, well, any time would be would be absolutely awful. But they are having to battle with uh, these circumstances, which, which would in any industry um, look like an absolute nightmare. But they're having to do it with individual customers demanding their money back um, on the reasonable grounds. They would say that. Um, well, hang on. Yeah, we. I, I, I signed this deal with you under the package travel regulations 2018. Um, therefore, you, know, you, you knew that um, if you weren't able to deliver the holiday, then I would um, uh, want my money back within two weeks. Um, what's the problem? They would say, and I'm doing everything I can to encourage people to talk to their travel firms to to understand what's happening. You know, to talk to, uh, to just to say, well, okay. When do you think you can get the money back for me? Um, you've then got ABSA on top of that saying, well, we've got this new concept, the ref refund credit note, which is, well, I call it a sort of super voucher or an IOU, which has some merit. Um, but unfortunately, and I hope nobody watching this is, is in this, um, th th there, there's everything to be said for saying to your customers, we are having the most, you wouldn't believe how awful this time is. And here's what the challenge we have. And here's why you're not going to see any money this side of July. Um, and at least as a customer, I, th I think, okay, well, that's that's awful. Yeah, Paul Lisa, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I understand that. And by the way, you're, you're of course, your uh, Atoll and in some cases, uh, ABTA protection stays in place. I can understand that. Being told, as I think was happening an awful lot, particularly at the start of this, uh, ABT has changed the rules. We don't need to do that anymore. I'm afraid is, um, is as soon as people start misrepresenting the legal situation, <laughs> that that is, um, I'm afraid they've stepped too far. And I, 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 you know, I, while I still sympathise with their predicament, um, if you start making things up, fibbing, to your customers, then I think you're sunk. Um, and well, I mean, let's, let's let's just take the example of, of one company which uh, has always prided itself for the last what 50 years on on 
keeping customers' money separate. So Trail Finders, I think, is hanging, handing back cash at £1 million a day, but is still way behind because you know, how can you turn from uh, an organisation that uh, has lovely offices in um, uh, expensive uh, uh, commercial properties uh, dotted around the country to an organisation where nobody's in the office and everybody's at home with a mobile phone and a laptop trying to um, uh, get people refunds. Um, but longer, to, uh, and you can contrast that with what's happening maybe at TUI where they're, I know there's lots of good people doing their best, but on the other hand, they've been, you know, they now say to me, so I'm playing refund bingo with my own, um, uh, my, my own uh, flights, holidays that I've booked. Um, so who's on the list? I've got um, EasyJet, Ryanair, British Airways. Um, they're all being slow. I'm look, waiting to see who's going to be the first out of the pack to uh, refund my money out of those airlines. Um, Tui, p and and Cunard. And, you know, anything up to two months, um, even though that uh, clearly uh, doesn't comply with the rules. And no kind of... Um, yeah, you must understand this is this is what we're going through. It was just kind of oh, you get your money back then. Um, and uh, as a customer, I'm, I, I, we will learn a great deal out of this. And I hope everybody is keeping notes about how they're feeling, about what's going on, about who's doing great things, who isn't, because you can be absolutely sure that um, uh, customers are keeping mental notes about who's doing well and who isn't. And you've got silly things like you know changing changing tack halfway through. I know we've got lots of. Um, viewers in in the uae so emirates great airline um you know the biggest intercontinental carrier of passengers measured in um uh route passenger kilometers um they began really badly by saying uh, vouchers only and then after me and quite a number of other people have said actually <laughs> i think you'll find that's not the rules they've come out with one of the best policies um and I hope we learn in future when there's another crisis, as inevitably there will be. Um, the, the, the motto that I've come up with is very simply, be fast and be fair. Say what your policy is and make sure it's one that people would, would live with. Um, and maybe a little bit of transparency might be, you know, the key hit thing here is actually what you said is like, we're really struggling here. This is unprecedented. We've never given back all this money. We have no idea what we're doing. We're going to try and do it as soon as possible. You know, maybe that people would appreciate that bit. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're in this together. Um, I, absolutely. I think there's a, a most certainly a mindset out there which you can you, you can kind of take advantage of in the best possible sense. But um, that has to be if you are being fair to people. Um, and not everybody is, and um, exactly the opposite of uh, uh, what Emirates is doing so commendably now is uh, what um, my dear friends Ryanair are doing, which is starting off being, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're the goodies. Uh, look at us. Um, British Airways taking the, the no refunds button off, uh, the, the automatic refunds button off. So has EasyJet. Um, we will give you a refund in 20 days. And OK, that's not the seven days stipulated under European passenger rights rules, but I'll take that. They even wrote to me 10 days ago and said, we're really sorry. It's taking a bit longer than we'd hoped. OK, fair enough. At least you're uh -huh. keeping me informed. You know, uh, communicate with your customers. That's all very good. And then finally, yeah, oh, yeah, well, actually, why don't you have a voucher? They're really good, these vouchers. No, <laughs> no, no, go on, have a voucher. No, please, have a voucher. Have a voucher. They're great. And then they sent out a couple of nights ago, uh, another email saying you really don't understand how great these vouchers are if you don't if you don't spend it in a year you will give you your money back and immediately everybody like me who applied for a refund thought they're telling me i'm not having a refund for a year it's just awful so they were being fast and fair and now they've they've sort of stopped well, I just have to say that we're actually running over time at the moment. Well, we've got oh, no. Simon and I chatted at the beginning. You said, Simon, you're not actually going anywhere. So this was we're still going to have the Q&A. Don't worry. We're not going to rush through that. We might push this to a little bit. Uh, we were meant to finish at 2.45. So that was 15 minutes with the Q&A. We will still definitely have the 15 minutes with the Q&A. And yeah, you're not going anywhere in a hurry, are you? No planes to catch. So we'll, uh, uh, unfortunately, if only. So I think we'll, uh, yes, if only. We'll just carry on. My burning question, and I think this is what is on so many people's minds, both in the industry industry and you know as travelers which we all are as well do you think any of us will be going anywhere this summer and by anywhere i don't mean the living room uh yes absolutely um and i well i've, I've been too optimistic um i f f because there's a number of things which have happened which i simply wasn't expecting um 
And one of them actually is uh, the extraordinary series of flight bans which has um, spread across the world. I mentioned um, East Timor. I'm afraid your trip there, Lisa, is is off for now. Um, but that I wasn't expecting that. And that has done considerable harm, not just in the amount of distress it's caused for people who were you know, who've just been left the wrong side of a, a, a lockdown. Um, today, just this morning, the Foreign Office announced another seven flights back from Amritsar in Punjab. Now, that just gives you some idea of what, what this is the fifth wave of flights, just gives you the scale of the number of Brits who were, who were stuck out there because suddenly the uh, flight bans came in. Um, and because they all came in a very haphazard way, we don't know how they are going to be unlocked. And so I am, I began by saying ah, people will be going abroad to, to Europe in May. Um, I'm going to ask if I can if I can have sort of June instead, um, ideally early June. But I'll just run through the five tests that have to happen before anybody goes on holiday for fun. So first of all, you've got to get to uh, be able to get to the airport. Clearly, under current UK lockdown rules, you're not going to do that. Secondly, the Foreign Office needs to lift its extremely unhelpful advice against all foreign travel everywhere um, indefinitely. Um, I had a bit of a chat with them uh, this morning, um, <laughs> robustly, I hope, putting my, my point of view that that's ridiculous. Third thing is, um, is there going to be an airline, a tour operator prepared to take you? And that will depend. Of course, you know, they, they, they've been so, so harmed by this economically. That will that will depend on whether they think that it's not just me uh, who's going to be queuing up at Gatwick. It's going to be you and your family and everybody else. Um, fourth question, absolutely critical, is the destination country going to let you in? And that is why I think we will see a kind of patchwork. And I'm, you know, you, you, you've got a combination of um, you know, places like the Greek islands, absolutely tourism dependent, but also wonderfully free of coronavirus. And they've got this awful trade off. Um, between, well, do we let people in? Do we actually make something of this? Or do we get first mover advantage? And there will most certainly be that. Um, you know, there, there may only be a large minority of people desperate to get away, but they will remember the first place that they go to. And then we're up to number five, which is, can you tolerate whatever arrivals quarantine rules are put in place when you get back to the UK? And we had the, um, uh, the government last weekend um, kind of test driving a, a, a policy, which bizarrely, I think, because I've read the uh, medical advice on this, is extremely popular. So medical advice is no point having checks on arrival. Um, they're not going to work um, much better just to make sure that everybody who comes in is aware of what to do if they get symptomatic. And that's not just the World Health Organization, it's the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And I invite anybody who wants to, to look those up. And I've been saying to her, I'm blue in the face. Well, you know, I, first of all, I don't think, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a medical person, but I do read what medical people say. And secondly, you know, the UK, I think, has been a beacon in keeping open uh, during these times. But I can say as much as I want. And the government has discovered that it would be immensely immensely um, popular to put in place checks on people who are coming back. Those, those seven flights from Emirates, I think there's 40%, uh, sorry, I, I think there's 40 times more coronavirus in the UK than there is in Punjab. And so therefore, you're going to be testing people who have a microscopic chance of, um, of, of having uh, uh, coronavirus, and you would be better off going to Feltham, going to um, Hounslow, going to Hayes, going to the high street and, and randomly picking people and saying, right, we're going to give you a test because you actually get 40 times more people testing positive. Um, but no, there is strong support for a 14 day uh, quarantine, which you would spend in your house. You're not allowed to go out and they'll come around, knock on your door and say, Lisa, are you in? And you'd have to say, yes, here I am. And then they say, that's all right. If you're not in, then you're going to be fine. So uh, that that's the fifth test. And that would Clearly, from an awful lot of people, are you going to spend a week on a beach somewhere and then come back to two weeks of that? You're not really. 
And are you also going to get a week on if you do want to say go to you know Spain wherever on your holiday? Are there going to be quarantine laws there? It would make sense if they don't just let you in the hotel and you know wandering down down the beach, you know, as normal. Oh, oh, sure. Forgive me, uh, Lisa. What I meant to say was, yeah, I, I would class that the same as a yeah. You either want tourists or you don't, and no tourist is sensibly going to think, oh, I've got um, a, a fortnight in uh, uh, in the Algarve. If you're going to spend in all 14 days in an airport hotel near Faro Airport um, before you can go and have one beer on the beach and then get your flight back, so so yeah, no, that th- there is a uh, kind of correlation between lifting quarantine rules and lifting whatever flight bans, whatever bans you have. And of course, remember the British are going to be uh, non grata in a lot of places mm-hmm. because we have so tragically got such a high incidence of coronavirus. So you know, it might well be uh, Republic of Ireland um, will have a different uh, uh, welcome than, than we do. Um, well, I've read about people, I've read in the press, about, I've sort of poo-pooed the idea, actually, of people saying, well, actually, we're going to let in people from these countries, but we're not going to let in people from the UK because of your age. I just, I want to say I don't see that happening, but, you know, you know more than me. What Do you oh, see that actually it's happening? All- Oh, it's already happening. Yeah, I mean, I can give you a lot, long, long lists. Um, I, I, what was I checking out today? Because every day I look at the IATA website. It's well worth looking at just to see what the current flight bans are. Slovenia, um, this, uh, no, it was yesterday, forgive me. Uh, yesterday came up with this fantastic speciality list of people we like. And it was things like, you, know, you, you can go through, you can come to Slovenia, Slovenia as long as you're Slovenian. Um, everybody else stay away. Oh, except if you're from North Macedonia, <laughs> Monaco, and other completely, you know, completely Luxembourg. I'm going to say just a completely random selection of small countries. So that, it's already happening. But more, yeah, you know, more to the point. And we were seeing this a lot at the start of the crisis. Um, you know, people were just saying Italy, China, you can't come in. Um, and I think we will see more of that. And. From a statistical point of view, I'm afraid that has a lot more merit than um, testing everybody who comes into the UK, since almost every country that they could possibly come from has a lower incidence of uh, COVID-19 than we do. So it's such a lesson for us, isn't it, really, in terms of like national pride and everything. You know, people with a, a good passport, a UK, oh. a British, you know, anyone, a USA passport. You know, these are things that we, we see are quite good and they've often opened doors for us. And actually, you know, that's not necessarily the case anymore. It's actually quite humbling in a way, I guess. Uh, well, uh, now you're almost getting on to, um, oh, uh, uh, here we are, blue passports, which I, I would yeah. still say are oh, black. Here's my, um, I, I know that I'm the only person old enough to have had one of these, um, but that takes us on to the whole Brexit thing and how I welcome know. we are going to be. But that's that's another um, encounter, I think, isn't it? Possibly not this one. But it's a whole other that, that is, that is you know, one reason you can, I can absolutely say confidently to lots and lots of consumers in the past, you know, in the next um uh seven months go to uh sorry forgive me eight months um you you can go to anywhere in europe and don't worry about coronavirus so because if you are unlucky enough to contract it you are entitled under under the ehic scheme to have um uh free or very reduced uh cost medical treatment so um i would say that uh uh, we, we've got to bear in mind this will become more and more apparent as we go through the year, what is going to happen with um, uh, Brexit and how that is going to play into it. And the government, as you will have seen, is showing exactly no signs of thinking, oh, right, we're going to apply for a, an extension. They've got to do that, I think, by the end of June, um, if they do want to stay longer. So I've just realised I look like um, the, there's something ha- odd happening with the lighting. There we are. That, I, I look a bit le- less like um, uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon. Anyway, there we are. <laughs> we're, not, we're not judging you. You look wonderful <laughs> to me. Uh, lastly, I'm going to ask you my last question, just because I know that people are desperate to ask you some questions as well. Will the travel industry ever be the same again? No, it won't be the same. Of course not. Uh, it will be great um, because... Uh, the decades have proved, the crises have proved that we have an extraordinarily resilient uh, travel industry. However, it, there will be this massive shakeout in which um, the stronger, the better run companies will thrive and the individuals who can deliver great service will will flourish. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if we're talking about WTM 2025, um, I'm really looking forward to it because, uh, you know, it will... 
in a sense, there are so many opportunities to have a healthier, better, stronger industry. And I guess one of the things which is most certainly going to be on the um, on the table when we come out the other end is, OK, well, let's talk about pipeline money. Let's talk about what happens to my cash when I book a trip. Um, where is it going to be and how quickly in extreme circumstances you're going to be able to get it back to me? And that's a discussion which I know that um, ABTA will be keen to have. Um, as well. Indeed. So we're going to go on to our questions now. Our first question is from Christian. Hello, Christian. And Christian says, hi, Simon. Do you think that this pandemic will affect the booking patterns of the travelling consumer? And how do you think this will affect different tour operators, travel agents and airlines? Do you think this change will affect pricing strategies in future? A lot to unpack there, but I'm sure you've oh, got no, it, Simon. Uh, great, great question, Christian. And it most certainly will. You know, there is nothing like a crisis and the effects of it to um, change uh, consumer behaviour. And so many people, and again, particularly towards the start of the crisis, particularly people who'd be uh, on cruises, were in extreme distress because something they booked 18 months earlier wasn't going to go ahead. And um, I'm afraid there will be a lot of people who will be saying, book late to avoid disappointment. Um, there will be a move towards you know, maybe a six week booking horizon this summer. It could be a six day booking horizon. <laughs> you know, people will not want to commit very far in advance. Um, and so, yeah, behavior will change quite dramatically. It will be uh, obviously, well, maybe this feeds into the previous topic, which was you know, what happens to pipeline money uh, if, if people are, are not um uh, are not committing and uh, not paying until six weeks beforehand. Um, that, that's going to change the financial structure of the industry. Um, and the implications are simply, well, keep your nerve um, and, and don't expect your booking trends to look anything like um, what they looked like um, uh, before any of us had heard of COVID-19. Yeah, hold your nerve indeed. So we've got a question from Laura who says, last year the world was talking much more about the climate emergency. Very good question, Laura. Yep. But IATA and others now suggest that people will be so determined to travel post lockdown that they're forecasting accelerated growth over the next 15 years. Do you think COVID-19 will resu result in travel and tourism losing interest in all the risks around climate and biodiversity? I think it will result in the world losing interest in the contribution of travel and in particular aviation to climate change and that is simply because um, there is not going to be so much travel there is not going to be so much aviation um, we could have been sitting here having a discussion about what's runway three at Heathrow going to mean that has been kicked so far down the road it's um, it, you know, it, it's irretrievable um, we will be waiting certainly 10 years uh, maybe 20 before it's even back on the table again. And by that stage, there will, may, will be other mobility uh, solutions found. Sorry, I sound like a marketing executive, mobility <laughs> solutions. Yeah, maybe that we've moved much more into rail. One small development, Laura, which um, I'd like to point out, is that Air France, who've just been given 7 billion euros, that's 6 billion pounds, um, one of the conditions written into the small print um, is, tell you what, Air France, in order for us to give you six billion pounds, um, you must promise not to sell domestic only flights on sectors where there is a rail option going to and from Paris of under two and a half hours. Sorry, that sounds really complicated, but basically it just means you can't sell Lyon to Paris on Air France only if they are connecting through to somewhere else. Otherwise, they've got to get on the train. So that's an interesting uh, you know, way, way of um, in, improving customer behaviour, reducing, of course, customer choice. Um, British Airways is flying its 747s to um, uh, Gloucestershire uh, to an airfield where, well, once you land there, you're not taking off again, I'm afraid. Um, 747s, just you know, a gas guzzling plane, great when uh, times were good. A um, bit like an old car, you know, it's paid for, it takes a bit of maintenance, but uh, and guzzles the fuel, but um, it's all right. BA have got rid of those. So there is going to be much, much less impact. And goodness me, I was going back over what I was writing a year ago with so much talk about over tourism, about um, the Dutch saying we're not going to spend anything on promoting Amsterdam. We don't want any more people there ever. Well, I think they might change their minds. Similarly, Venice, similarly, Barcelona. So these really important discussions need to continue to be uh, 
uh, held, but I don't think you're going to have so many people um, uh, who, who are um, getting very agitated about it because we're going from, uh, uh, hang on, hang on, that's quite enough um, uh, tourists, uh, quite enough cruise ships in the harbour in Dubrovnik uh, for one day um, to, uh, yeah, please, please come in, in, you know, in, in you go. And goodness me, we will also, I think, be better tourists. We will, I hope, cherish travel so much that we're going to say, I'm not going to just go away to somewhere I've never heard of and can't pronounce just because Ryanair will sell me <laughs> a ticket for 15 quid and I can hopefully make up that 15 quid on all the cheap beer I'll drink this weekend. We will actually be treasuring, prizing uh, travel a lot more. So we'll probably be you know, taking fewer trips, but making more of them um, and uh, spending longer in destinations. So I think it's going to be a sort of natural thing. Great question anyway, Laura. Thank you. It's a big conundrum for the travel industry. And I'm so glad that we talk about it. And I always make sure I talk about it on the podcast because we can't get away from it. The whole reason we travel is because we love the world, but our travel equally is, you know, killing the world in many ways. So fewer tourists for, for a while, you know, as we know, we've seen the pictures of the clean canals in Venice, we've seen dolphins in Marbella, you know, all sorts of things like that. It's, um, you know, that's the good thing about this is it's giving the, the world a little break from our, our habits. And hopefully we're all conscious about it. We are conscious about it. We do, we're doing our best, aren't we, as well as hopefully continue traveling. Uh, a question from Mario. He says, do you think people will be more or less, more or less, less risk averse once international travel resumes? Or will we fall into two groups? Some nervous to book, want to stay close to home and others thinking, sod it, let's go to some amazing places where we can. Uh, uh, absolutely. Mario, you've got it completely spot on. Um, there, the world is dividing very quickly, and I'm conducting every every uh, Thursday. I conduct the same poll in July. If you're able to go abroad, um, would you effectively? And the in the number of people who say yes, I would, um, is actually decreasing. It was 45 percent last week. It's 42 percent this morning, um, and and I think there is a, an increasing divergence between. People like me, and I hope uh, you, Mario, and and um, Lisa, and everybody else who's watching this, um, yeah, I cannot wait to, you know, I'm I'm going to be first at the airport, socially distancing, distancing in the queue um, to get to wherever is going to let us in first, and there will be this really strong uh, pent up demand. And and by the way, there's there's actually we're talking here about sort of straight um, uh, tourism. There, there are of course two really important other aspects and, and that is um uh people who've got loved ones you know there's lots and lots of long distance relationships which are are not being fulfilled in every sense at the moment so they're probably going to be at the front of the queue at the airport um and then people you know with family people with business interests they will have to travel so there's going to be a huge surge right at the start and then there'll be other people but 55 rising to 58 percent of people are are fearful they're saying, I don't want to go. And I think it is going to take, actually, the fact that you and uh, Mario and everybody else goes to places, has a fantastic time, are well, warmly welcomed, doesn't get caught with the wrong side of a lockdown um, before you get the kind of peer pressure, which is so, well, what did you do this uh, this summer? Or we stayed at home. Well, haven't you been doing that for the last three months anyway? Um, so, so I think... Yeah, there is going to be a lot of a lot of concern, but um, we will we will get out the other side. I, my, I personally, I'm thinking I might, I might drive down, you know, because my flights have gone at the moment. I'm, I'm hopefully getting refunds, even though I feel a bit naughty doing it. Sorry, sorry, airlines, but I'm trying to get refunds. And I'm actually going to drive down to Malaga. That's my plan. As soon as we are allowed, I'm in the car and I'm off, you know, and see how it goes. Objection, Your Honour. Um, yes. What are you going to say? That 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 you you're injecting complexity into it, Lisa, mm. because you are um, effectively having to deal with two sets of restrictions. Possibly, what's happening in France and what's happening in um, uh, in Spain. And if you uh, happen to go the pretty way, what's happening in Andorra as well? <laughs> um, and and so I would I you know people you get on the plane. Well, look, people are saying, "Oh, I'll drive mm. to Italy," but yeah, I'm, I'm I'm saying, well, just just so much easier just to. To, to fly um yes great uh, i can't imagine anything lovelier than a nice long drive through beautiful parts of france and spain down to marbella that's great but for your first trip i'll see you at the easyjet check-in socially distancing 
um, uh, near uh, yeah, as soon as we can. All right, you might have convinced me, but and, and also apparently the air on airline on airplanes is actually brilliant in terms of cleanliness, isn't it? As I was reading something the other day about it being cleaned often. I don't know, you know the details more than me. Uh, well, OK, there's a couple of things there. Just talk very briefly about the experience on board planes. Uh, yes, they've got HEPA filters, which are extremely high efficiency, which they claim will take out 99.9% .9 of, um, uh, of, of viruses. Um, and there is also talk of social distancing. If you're going to impose a two metre rule, then that effectively is a catastrophe for all airlines forever. Um, if you're going to say one metre, it's not so bad. Um, so it all depends what, what we get there. And passengers, I think, from a, a confidence point of view, will want to see some sensible international rules agreed. Uh, this is going to be our last question. Um, it's from Maria. And Maria says, any insight into when large events may start to happen around the globe again? And will the likelihood depend more on travel restrictions lifting or on people's confidence to travel so that the event and destination feel they could attract the numbers they need? I think and that's a great way to finish, because I think the uh, big events which generate so much uh, travel are going to be really, really important for this. Um, how we cope with them clearly is a um, is another story. Uh, but I think that they will start again. I mean, clearly you've got to. We had to cancel the Olympics. Um, I think we cancelled that early March, didn't we? Um, or rather, the IOC did, uh, because frankly, um, athletes' training schedules were being so disrupted that it would have been impossible to have a meaningful games. So that's okay. The um, Edinburgh Festival, I was quite surprised mm. about because actually, um, if you've got domestic tourism back in the UK, then you, you, know, you, you could probably do that. Just come up with some rules. And I, I'm all in favour of big events continuing as much as possible. We are learning every day uh, more and more about this virus. We, of course, uh, salute all the people who are doing such amazing work in, in caring for people who are. Who, who, uh, have COVID nineteen and also developing vaccines and so on, um, but I know I think I think big events will be a really good confidence booster, and I think while they won't be necessarily as big as you would expect normally, the fact that they are happening would be very symbolic. So start of the next football season, you know, if whatever rules you've got in place at Old Trafford, it's still going to be a monumental event, and uh, I think a very important one. So, Simon, I will see you at the airport. I'm off to Malaga, possibly flying. Now you've convinced me as soon as we can. And uh, where will you be off to? Where will you go as soon as you're let out? Um, I, I think it could just be the Republic of Ireland, because um, I, I think if we form a little travel bubble along with um, the Republic of Ireland, that will probably be the first place. But I'm watching. And if it's Belarus, I don't mind. Minsk, here I come. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this, Simon, as much as I have and everyone watching. I've re it's just been lovely just to sit and talk about travel, you know, with people that have that passion for travel. And hopefully the industry will be getting back on its feet and we'll be off when it's safe and everyone's safe and it's healthy and we're all OK to do so. Uh, thank you so much. And this will be on demand on WTM Global Hub and here on Bright Talk as well. So hopefully see you all soon. See you soon, Simon. Take care. Thank you so much. Stay strong. Thank you.